Alrighty, with the school year about to kick off again, let's take a quick look at some general things you'll find in a science lab. Should of course start with safety goggles because as Professor Chang says, safety first. You're wearing protective goggles to destroy my car? Safety first! Right, now that our eyes are nice and safe, let's get on to some actual equipment. This is, of course, a beaker. Uh, this is a 150ml beaker, but they do come in different sizes. Now, beaker is a standard container to put uh, solutions in, uh, maybe even do a reaction in. Uh, you see, they do have markings up the side so you could kind of measure out like in the in the top one you could measure up to 500 mils of um of a solution but you wouldn't really use these for measuring they're not all that accurate more for sort of just doing reactions in like maybe you want to do the catalyzed decomposition of hydrogen peroxide which would look like this This is a stirring rod. This is a plastic stirring rod. Uh, its job, funnily enough, is for stirring in your beaker. Um, you can get plastic or glass stirring rods. They're not just for stirring. In this photo, a student is decanting a solution from a beaker. So here we have a metal spatula, uh, flat on one end and scooped on the other, like a little spoon. Um, and of course, you can um, scoop up some chemicals to move chemicals from one container to another, in this case, this is iodine crystals. A thermometer, a lot of the time when you're doing um, a practical, you might want to measure the temperature. Um, so we tend to have alcohol thermometers uh, now, not mercury thermometers anymore. Uh, alcohol thermometers are safer. Uh, thermometers are very thin pieces of glass and quite easy to break. Uh, so you don't really want mercury being spilled out. Now this is, well, its proper name is an Erlenmeyer flask. Usually we just call them a conical flask because funnily enough, they look like a cone. Uh, now like the beakers, you can see uh, markings where you could measure, I suppose you could measure um, certain volumes of solution, but you wouldn't really. Uh, you would use them to do um, carry out experiments in, uh, in this case, doing a titration to a conical flask. Now, these are what you would actually measure out in because the name, funnily enough, is measuring cylinder. It's also called a graduated cylinder. Okay, so we've got three different sizes here. Uh, the largest in this photo being a 250 mil measuring cylinder. It's also a 100 mil and a 25 mil. Um, and so you can see they have many more graduations. So these are what you would actually use to measure out much more accurately an amount of solution. You could also use a measuring cylinder to just actually not do measuring, but carry out an experiment. In this case, uh, the catalyzed decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. This is the same experiment that the video showed earlier, um, but this time I dropped in a, a few drops of um, detergent, liquid detergent. Uh, so we get bubbles while well, making the foam. Here is another absolutely standard piece of equipment in the science lab. It is, of course, a test tube. Now, test tubes come in different sizes. The first one was just a standard one. Uh, this one is larger. This is about two centimeters in diameter, and it's called a large test tube, or when I was growing up back in New Zealand, we called them a boiling tube, uh, because if you're going to do boiling, uh, you would do it in generally in the larger variety. So. There they are, a standard test tube and a boiling tube or a large test tube. Now you can't just keep holding a test tube while you're doing your experiment. So we have these things. This is a test tube rack um, and your test tubes literally just stand up vertically so that you can go on with doing other things related to your experiment. You can use your hands for other things. Uh, now, if you were heating in a test tube, you might not want to hold the test tube. 
that's okay. We have these test tube holders. Um, one variety is a sort of metal variety you squash it in the middle um, and that will open the end out and you can hold a test tube like that. I myself don't really like these ones. I much prefer the, the big peg variety. Uh, it does exactly the same job. Um, I just think it holds the test tube a bit more securely. Uh, the metal on glass, if, there's, um, if the glass is wet, uh, it can become a bit slippery, but this uh, wooden peg, um, that's my go-to. Doing the heating, you would need one of these. This is, of course, a Bunsen burner. Anytime you write Bunsen, give it a capital B. It is named after Mr. Bunsen. So this is a Bunsen burner, uh, and it attaches to the gas tap. Now, with the lever at 90 degrees to the actual gas nozzle, as in this image, uh, the gas tap is turned off. To turn the gas on, you just rotate that top uh, lever so that it's parallel to the gas nozzle. Now, gas taps aren't really a slowly turn it on kind of thing. It's it's like it's black and white. It's either on or it's off. I see a lot of students slowly, sort of carefully, nervously turn them on. Just grab that lever, spin it around, make it parallel to the gas nozzle. It's now on. Uh, so. We put the gas hose from the Bunsen, just literally push it onto the gas tap. Uh, and this is a heat mat. This is what we actually set the Bunsen on. We don't use a Bunsen just on the on the desk. We put it on a heat mat, okay? Um, so there we go, Bunsen on the heat mat. And this is what the whole setup should look like. Now, speaking of that heat mat, if your heat mat looks like this, you can. This is a quite a close image, but you can see the crisscrossy, uh, sort of woven pattern, um, and it's, it's fairly soft. That's actually the underside of the heat mat. You've got it upside down. Your heat mat should be hard, smooth, um, <laughs> probably dirty, uh, like this one. But this is the way to have it up. If we just go back a bit, there it is. Okay, so it's that hard, more shiny surface. That's the top of your heat mat. That's the part that the Bunsen actually sits on. Now, moving back forward, that's the upside down, that's the top surface. Um, here we go, this is a tripod. And funnily enough, for its three legs. Uh, so a tripod you would put over the top of your Bunsen. You tend to put this thing on it. This is a gauze mat. Uh, so this actually sits on top of the tripod. Now this is great for holding your beaker on when you want to heat up the solution in your beaker the Bunsen will be sitting underneath the tripod um, and heating through the gauze mat to the solution in your beaker now the job of the gauze mat is not actually to stop the beaker falling through that's what a lot of uh, students first think it's actually to um, spread the heat more evenly so rather than heating the beaker in one uh, place um, being made of metal the gauze mat will distribute the heat so it will heat the solution more evenly and um, hopefully not break the beaker because beakers are just made of glass, tough glass, but they can crack if they're heated strongly in one place. So here's another piece uh, that you'll see floating around the, around the science lab. This is a retort stand. Now it tends to come hand in hand with these things, the boss head and clamp. So they attach like this and then they attach onto the retort stand like so. And from this, you can clamp things that you don't really want to just stand around holding for, you know, it might be five minutes, it might be two hours, uh, it might be something getting hot. Okay, so whatever it is, um, it doesn't really matter the reason, but this is your retort stand with boss head and clamp. So like you might even want to clamp your Bunsen, which um, we saw before sits on the heat mat, and then the flame just goes upwards. But maybe you want your flame coming out sideways, so you can clamp a Bunsen horizontally like this. Or you could clamp um, a boiling tube, a large test tube, with some heated potassium chlorate and then uh, drop in a jelly baby, as we'll see now.
Another type of clamp that you could attach to your retort stand is a ring clamp. Now you might want to attach a ring clamp to hold a very large measuring cylinder upside down, like Shaney and India in this photo. Uh, so they're not actually measuring anything in the measuring cylinder, they're just using it to trap uh, the butane gas from a uh, big cigarette lighter. Okay, so this was measuring the molar mass of butane. Uh, that's the setup there. And so that we just clamped a measuring cylinder upside down using the ring clamp. Another time you might want to use a ring clamp is when you're wanting to attach a piece of filter paper. And why would you do that? So you could pour on your nitrogen triiodide. And why would you do that? So you could leave it to dry. And why would you do that? So you could touch it with something, uh, preferably not your finger. Uh, a meter ruler would be a good thing to use. Uh, it's commonly known as touch powder. Let's take a look. Now here's another container, this is called a crucible, uh, and it has its lid next to it. So there's the crucible and the lid. It's a very small container, um, and you would just put things in, like in this case some hydrated copper 2 sulfate is being placed into it. Now the reason you'd use a crucible instead of just like a, a small beaker, a uh, crucible is what you can heat things in, and you can heat things very strongly. Remember when we're heating in a beaker, like just heating solutions, uh, we use a gauze mat and it distributes the heat. Well, the crucible, you can heat directly in one spot, so you can heat it uh, very strongly. Um, now, the crucible would fall through the hole in the tripod, but we use this thing. This is a pipe clay triangle. Now, this sits on top of a tripod, like so. And then you would put your crucible on, like so. And then, of course, the Bunsen underneath, and you, you do your heating. So here's the crucible with lid. It may have something in, um, and you could heat that. So in the photograph on the left, we can see we've got some hydrated copper 2 sulfate in the crucible, about to get some heating underway. Um, and the setup is just repeated on the right in that image with the lid there. You'll note the lid is actually slightly ajar. You wouldn't heat something like that. Like in, the, in this pack, we're driving off the water of crystallization. So the water has to go somewhere. So there had to be a hole to let the steam out. Um, so we didn't just have the lid on nice and flat. We left it on a bit of an angle. Now. These are metal tongs. Some people like to use the uh, the curvy bit just back from the end to wrap around a beaker, to carry a beaker, like maybe if the beaker was hot. I would not suggest you do that. Um, what I think they're great for is the very end, um, sort of almost like a little, little pliers. Um, and you can see here the student is using the metal tongs to, you know, to check on their um, heating of the copper 2 sulfate so they can lift the lid off. No, that's very hot, of course, it's being heated very strongly over the Bunsen, so it's very hot. So we use the tongs to uh, move the lid to check. This is what I would suggest you uh, carry a hot beaker with. These are called hot hands, and you get various varieties of these. Uh, some labs might just have like uh, essentially a big oven mitt, um, but you know, use something like this to hold your, your hot glassware. Um, it has better grip, especially if the glass is wet. Better grip than metal on glass. So I wouldn't use metal tongs to carry hot beakers. Use something like hot hands or, like I say, an oven mitt even. All right, these two are evaporating basins of different sizes, one large and one medium size. Um, you could just put, let's say, a salty solution in there, leave it overnight, come back the next day, you'll just have salt in your evaporating basin when the water's evaporated. Uh, you don't have to use it for evaporation. Um, in this case, we were uh, testing fuels. Well, we were seeing how cleanly different um, compounds will burn. We had cyclohexane and cyclohexene. Um, and you can see the compound on the right was burning much more cleanly. There's a lot less soot inside the evaporating basin. All right, what we have here is a spotting tile. Uh, used for just putting small amounts of liquid or solution. Uh, in this case, it was custard uh, from a student's mouth. Now, um, after spitting out a little bit of the custard at 30 second intervals, they added some iodine solution. So you can see at the top left, um, we get the nice iodine starch, dark blue or blackish color forming. But then the longer the custard was in their mouth, look now to the lower right, 
uh, we just get the brown from the iodine. We don't get that dark color of the iodine starch because, of course, the starch was broken down in the mouth. So great. Um, that's a bit of a gross use of a spotting tile. Uh, this is a less gross use of a spotting tile, just testing different um, acid base indicators. Right, my guess is for this one, surely it is, of course, a funnel used for either uh, pouring without making a mess uh, or, of course, doing filtration, putting some filter paper in there and then filtering something through. All right, what we have here is a pasta pipette, um, sometimes called an eyedropper. Uh, this is a little plastic one. You also get glass versions with little rubber stoppers. You actually also get them um, as part of a bottle, a little dropper bottle. So you unscrew the lid and then the dropper is actually part of the lid. You can see a student here um, using one to test the salinity of seawater. Uh, here, Alicia is very carefully measuring out a certain amount of the cobalt chloride solution uh, using a, a small measuring cylinder. We mentioned those before. Um, the smaller the measuring cylinder, the more accurate the measurement is. So if you're only measuring out a few mils, you would use a small one like this. Okay, so here is a mortar and pestle um, used for grinding things up, like in this case, grinding up uh, calcium carbonate into a powder. Uh, now, just so you know, the mortar is the bowl and the pestle is the, uh, the rounded sort of grinding stick to use. Usually people just say mortar and pestle, yeah, but which is which? Well, now you know. Mortar is the bowl, pestle is the other part. Here's a Petri dish. This is a glass Petri dish, and this is one with its lid on. You could just put in some small specimens into your Petri dish. Um, they're often used to deliver agar, um, agar jelly if you're looking at bacteria growth, etc. So this is a watch glass. Uh, it's got a nice curved shape you can see there. You could put a bit of uh, chemical on top of the watch glass, or you can put the watch glass on top of a beaker. Um, maybe you want to do some evaporating. Um, or something like that. Uh, in this case, we've got, so oh, what do we have in this one? We had some, uh, copper was dissolved in solution, that's why the solution is blue. We had some sulfuric acid and put some zinc in. Uh, so the zinc actually displaces the copper out of solution, so you can see it forming there at the bottom of the beaker, uh, forming copper metal. This is a gas jar and lid, and this is the lid on the gas jar. Um, now, you might use a gas jar to trap some gas. Funnily enough, uh, like in this case, we trapped some ethyne gas, some acetylene gas. Um, and in order to make the ethyne gas, you might use a setup using something like this. Uh, this is just a trough, a water trough. Um, and this is a beehive shelf. Now, what we do here is we've got a gas jar upside down, completely filled with water, um, but it's sitting on the beehive shelf, which, let's just back up, you can see lower right, it's got that opening there that you can fit a hose into. Now, the hose is actually coming from where water was being dripped onto calcium carbide, and so that produces ethane gas, and so it comes through the hose and displaces the water out of the gas tube, and then you put the lid on and save it, go outside and light it. It's quite fun. Now, this is a volumetric flask. This is a 100 mil volumetric flask with its lid. Um, a 250 mil volumetric flask would be more common and you can get larger as well. The thing about these is they only have one graduation. So unlike a measuring cylinder, this flask only measures one volume, but it measures it very precisely. So you have like a 250 mil volumetric flask, you fill it right up to that mark and there's your 250 mils, used for uh, volumetric analysis uh, situations. Uh, meet the rulers. Sometimes you have to measure stuff. Uh, you want to roll a trolley along the bench? Well, how far is it going? Let's just use a meter ruler. Pretty standard stuff here. So we're just getting into the end of uh, what I've got to show you now. This is a, a bell jar and lid. And then we have some desiccators. Desiccators are to dry uh, things. We've got the crystals in the bottom absorb moisture. So you put your, your, um, well, your substance, whatever it is, into sort of the middle layer and then leave it overnight or a week or however long it will take uh, just to dry out. In any lab, you should also have a fire extinguisher. Um, and of course, you can get different types of fires. So this fire extinguisher is good for wood, paper, textiles, oil, liquid, and electrical fires. So it's pretty general. 
Um, now we've got emergency shutoff switches. Anyone should be able to um, hit these. Everyone in the lab should know where these are. And if you need to push the button and just go and push the button in. Uh, you can see it takes a key that's just to uh, release it so that you can have your power back or your gas back or your water back. But anyone should be able to turn them off and your teacher will be able to turn them back on again. This is an eyewash station. Uh, so you just push the big flat uh, push sign and the water starts coming out. Now this is quite a nice gentle one. Uh, usually in labs I've worked in we have things more like this. Um, again, it's just um, the water comes out the top, you just pull the trigger and the water squirts out. Uh, these tend to be quite, um, well, I won't say high pressure, but not all that gentle, let's say. Um, I really wouldn't want to put it up against my eye. On the other hand, uh, if you've got chemicals in your eye that's you know, giving you a burning sensation, well, this would be the best option. Uh, and that, of course, squares into a sink, any good science lab should have a sink. Um, the main sink as well as individual sinks around the lab for the students where they're doing their work. Uh, oh no, it broke some stuff. Oh, there you go, sweep it up. Should be a dustbin and broom somewhere around. Now, if there's any broken glass, that doesn't go into the normal rubbish bin, of course. That, that goes into a, a proper glass bin and your teacher will show you where that is. Now, when you've uh, finished doing what you're doing and you've got some um, stuff left over, you don't just necessarily wash it down the sink. Some uh, substances are okay to go down the sink, but often they're not. Uh, so in a science lab, you tend to find things like this, a bottle for the um, organic waste, another one for the heavy metal waste, etc. because some things really should not go down the sink. It's really not good for the environment. And that about wraps it up. What I've been showing are just general items that you find in a science lab. Uh, now, you, you'll be using other things as well in the science lab. You might be using a light box when you do physics um, with different sorts of mirrors and prisms. Um, you might be using pulley systems. You might be using trolley systems, maybe with masses on top. Uh, you might be using a syringe with larger masses on top to look at Boyle's law. Uh, you might be using a microscope. You might be using a dissection kit. So depending on what you're actually doing, other materials or equipment will be brought into the lab as well. Uh, so yeah, that was a bit of a refresher on the things you'll be using in the science lab. Don't forget to hit the like button. Yeah. And subscribe to It's Up Here. And here's another video.